Okay, hello there parents. Um, well, Stuart Wilson here from Zest Life Therapeutic Services. Um, I just wanted to put together a short video to help those who might have school goers, particularly six years at the moment. And since obviously we had this um, announcement by the government on Friday last that the uh, extension was going to happen into the end of July, 29th of July, that um, people are asking me, what can we do to help our young people get across the line? And what can we do as parents to try and assist? So I put together a short video, if it's okay, I'm gonna share some slides with you. So hopefully it's only gonna last about 20 minutes or so. Um, and hopefully in some shape or form, this will be helpful for you to be able to help with your own children, but also just to be able to have some tips and tools that we can use to be able to help our young people at the moment. So I'm hoping that this will come up now as a share and hopefully you should be able to see that um, saying hello parents. So all going well, that's up now. First of all, just to start by saying I'm aware that we have a lot of parents who are going through difficult times right now. You may be frontline staff working in hospitals or nursing homes, um, etc. So to all kind of doctors and nurses and frontline staff, care workers, I um, just want to say a huge thank you to you guys for all the incredible work that you're doing, to those helping us to continue life as normal through producing retail, groceries, pharmacies, etc. Again, thank you so much for all that you're doing. Um, and also, I think, I think for quite a while I was getting a little bit um, confident and cocky about uh, leaving my home every day and having a great day, loving what I do, but going to an office every day. We have a clinic in Churchtown in Dublin and in Harold's Cross, Dublin. Um, and I'd leave the house every day with a smile on my face, saying to my wife as I'd leave and giving her a kiss to say, have a great day and walking out the door, bringing my three youngest children, I have five kids, we're bringing my three youngest to school. And as I'd leave, I'd give her a kiss and say, have a great day. Go off to, to, to work and uh, come home most days having had a great day and enjoyed my day and then meeting up with my wife and kids again in the evening time, uh, having a nice dinner and then having a talk or a little chat about our great day. I got kind of almost cocky about it. Um, and then all of a sudden this happened. And that's put a little bit of a spanner in the works. I'm not sure how you're coping in your houses, but this whole area has been completely changed. Uh, my entire geography of my house and also the way that I do life right now. So I, my heart goes out to all of you. I know it's not easy, but homeschooling has been very interesting. Now I'm having great difficulty getting my kids to one, go to bed, to get out of bed. Um, last night, um, I was actually just trying to go, about 11 o'clock in the evening, go from my bathroom, my main bathroom to my bedroom, which is only about 10 feet. And in that time that it took me to get from one to the other after having a shower with a towel around me I managed to almost appear in two TikTok videos um, which to uh, everyone's alarm was quite uh, disturbing so it's a completely different world out there at the moment for us and uh, I completely and totally get that um, I also if it's okay just want to give you a little idea what we're going to do for about the next 20 minutes I'm going to start off a tiny bit negative just explaining some of the things that we're seeing clinically that have a little bit of a worry for me with kids at the moment um, and I want to talk a tiny bit about that if that's okay and then I just want to give you a couple of tips as parents as to things that I mean totally honest with you I'm finding this difficult in my home um, I think most parents are so I'm humbly going to suggest some things that I'm trying that are working so both from a professional context but also from a, a personal context these are things that I'm trying at home that seem to be helping and making life a little easier. I'm also going to talk as parents about how important I think it is to look after ourselves during this time as well. Uh, and I will give you contact details at the end. So if it's a thing that you have some questions or queries that are not being answered in this, that you think you'd love to be more specific about, uh, please just drop me a, an email or a text to the numbers that I will give you and I'd be delighted to uh, connect with you. So let me start by saying this, if it's okay. Uh, we're doing a video directly to young people as well, to sixth years. So you can ask them to click in on that. This one obviously is specifically for parents, but ask them to click in on that and it gives them some tips to be able to help them to get through uh, what is now a marathon to the leaving cert, not a sprint anymore after Easter. Uh, truth is, I fear at the moment that we are actually gonna have a little bit of a mental health tsunami um, come post pandemic. My reason for that is thinking is a couple of things. First of all, our um, young people at the moment are being forced online and that's absolutely fine, understandably so. We all are, even me working therapeutically um, in our clinics with all of our therapists here, we're being forced online and that's acceptable and correct and right right now. But because they're being forced online, they're getting exceptional amounts of screen time. And even that in itself, anybody who knows me knows I talk a lot about 
uh, screen time and how important, I'm a techie, I love technology, but how important it is to monitor and be careful about the amount of time that we spend online because it has an impact on our mental health um, and our cortisol levels within our central nervous system. So I, I fear a mental health tsunami if we're not careful. So I wanna draw our attention, if it's okay, in this video to a th few things that even though we're online a lot more, uh, will help us because we're, we're spending so much time using cyber. Um, our kids obviously at the moment are going through a tough time. This news and the Leaving Cert being extended has been very difficult for them. And I think we got to acknowledge that that's really hard for them. It's unfair. They're expecting a summer. They're expecting, you know, the Leaving Cert to be finished and then to be able to enjoy their summer and then to go on to whatever they were doing after that. So it's not just the delay, but it's also the uncertainty for them. And as we know, uncertainty produces anxiety. So it is an unfair situation. They're worried, but they're also worried about this pandemic. And it's hard for our young people as well as ourselves, but it's hard for our young people not to have their contact of their friends. You and I both know that our young people go to their friends so often, as opposed to even sometimes their parents, to be able to chat and have, have fun time together. Even a young man I was talking to recently saying he was missing the physical contact of just even connecting with his friends, you know, to be able to, as guys will do, shoulder bump their mates and have a chat. That's not even happening now, and that's really difficult because they're very they're physical in the way that they communicate. Um, and also they're just their normal go-tos are not available to them. So those friends are not available in the flesh. They have to be done online. Those relationships are online um, quite more than normal, of course. So missing friends is tough. And also grandparents, for them, it's difficult. Young people generally spend a lot of time and are very connected with their grandparents in lots of cases. And that's very difficult. So I, I want to highlight some of these issues. So on the far side of this, we will hopefully limit or bring down the um, concerns we might have about mental health. So... With that in mind, I just want to move on to say this. What, what can we do as parents to help them to, to get over the line in uh, coming towards the Leaving Cert? Number one, first, we need to do this for ourselves uh, first, folks, if it's okay to say this. I don't know about you, but the first week of this pandemic, I, am, I really went off center a little bit. I, I found it really difficult. The normal routine of what you do every day was completely knocked out. And as a result of that, uh, just the general uh, normal run of the day, knowing what was going to happen, having the certainty of that day, it disappeared all of a sudden. And for that first few days, I found that really difficult. Um, and I want to say this to you guys. Are you taking stock? Are you okay? Or how are you doing? You can't help your young people if you're not full first. So it's a little bit like the picture where we say we can't put on or help anyone around us on an airplane if we haven't got our own mask on first. Who are you leaning on? I said to your young people in their video, um, you got to lean on somebody right now. It's really important to reach out and connect and, and communicate with people. And as parents, who are you doing that with? Are you doing that with your partner? If you haven't got a partner, are you doing that, that with a friend perhaps? But it's really important to reach out. I've said here as well, it's also important to self-regulate, which is just a little different. You know, I don't know about you, but my moods change more than they would have uh, in any given day at the moment. I just think it's, it's more difficult to regulate mood. And I just think how you, you've got to find ways to maintain that, to look after yourself in that. Maybe that's whatever works for you. We'll talk a little bit later on about what can work for you to help you with that. If it's getting out for a walk, if it's, if it's getting um, a little bit of exercise or if it's reading or something, you've got to find ways to regulate your own wellness throughout the, throughout the day. Creating important routines um, daily for yourself is really, really important so that then um, our young people will find it easier to slip into routines better. I've mentioned here to be intentional about relationships. What I mean by that? I even found in those first few days going for a walk for an hour or so um, when I was feeling a little bit off center, massively helped and actually reaching out and connecting with other people was a huge benefit to me. So making a phone call while I was walking and being able to have a conversation and a chat with family or friends to say, hey, how are you doing? How are you getting on? How is this for you? How's your children? How's your families? Um, really helped. It really encouraged me because well, well, I was able to encourage them, which was nice, but they were also encouraging me and they were grateful for a conversation or a call. And I just found when I came back from those hour walks or so that I just, my moods were, were really lifted. My serotonin levels, my mood levels were lifted and I felt better. The other thing which I think is really important as well is because kids are around a lot more and we are around them a lot more and we're around each other a lot more as parents, it's really important. My wife and I had ended up having a conversation in that first week to say, how are we going to do parenting for the next while? because um, we were making mistakes and we were finding ourselves going off center and just getting a little bit even touchy with each other. So it was really important to try and unite and stay united as parents. Now, this sounds a little bit obvious. Um, listen to their moans. I said to our young people in their, their video that I sent out, um, it, it's actually just really important right now to be able to have a good old Irish moan, you know, to be able to, um, my grandmother used to say, a problem shared is a problem halved. 
um, it's really important for us as parents because they're probably our young people are um, quicker to moan. Their, their entire day is completely different. A young person was in with me recently talking about this and said, um, we were having this conversation, actually it was online, we were saying what, what was impacting uh, her most, she's about 15, and she just said, you know, every day when I go to school, I have a big heavy bag, I'm wandering around the place, even just the, the constant going to and from classes, the carrying a heavy bag to and from classes, I expel so much energy just doing my day. She said, okay, now I'm doing workouts in front of the TV and I'm wandering around the back garden doing exercises and things like that, but I'm not expelling the energy I used to expel. So she said, it's much harder for me to sleep at night. I'm going to talk about sleep in just a moment. We need to listen to our young people and listen to them moaning. And almost, um, I'm saying here, don't offer advice. Maybe your young people are like mine when they say they don't want my wisdom. <laughs> they want my relationship, but they don't want my wisdom. They, want to, they don't want to be told what to do. They won't listen anyway. And we've got to listen without an intent to listen to reply, if that makes sense. So we're not listening to them with an intent to what we're going to say back. We're listening to them to hear them because as we're listening to them, their central nervous systems are actually calming down. They're actually self-soothing by talking and we're assisting them by listening. If you're talking and they're listening, you might be soothing yourself, but you're actually not to them at all. And in fact, in most cases, they're not listening anyway. So telling them what to do simply won't work. And if you do find yourself offering that wisdom, just stop and think to yourself, what question am I going to ask that's going to get them to talk more? Because that's really what they need to do right now. I've mentioned there, you know, they are afraid. And, and aren't we all right now? It's difficult circumstances for them. So we're all in the same boat. Um, I've mentioned here, offer yourself as one of those go-to people that your young people can lean on. And that might sound, of course, you know, we do that anyway all of the time. They know I'm here for them. I'm mum or dad. Truth is, um, young people don't tend to go to mum or dad quite so much. There was a Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland um, research done, I think about six years ago um, from when it was first released, which just talked about how young people who have gone through difficult times, um, in most cases this was clinical times, gone through anxiety or depression, um, that when they had gone through it, they were asked on the far side of that, what was it that got you through? What was the thing or what was it that helped? And in 95% in of cases, each of those young people said that it was a significant other older person a significant other older person. And actually the older person wasn't or didn't tend to be mum or dad. It tended to be things like, um, well, maybe a therapist, but a teacher, um, it could have been a principal, it could have been uh, a youth worker, a youth pastor. It could be things like, um, you know, a rugby coach or a Gaelic coach or a hockey coach, um, anything like that, that made them feel like they were important and had them been able to go to that person to feel like they would always be there for them. Most young people will go to a significant other older person. And I've just said here, you, you, we make ourselves available, certainly as mum or dad, and say, listen, you know I'm here for you. Even if they, every time you ask them how they are, they just say, fine. It's to go a little bit further and go, well, you know I'm always here for you if you need me. Making that bid, I call it making a bid for your kids, making a bid for them to know that they're there is helpful, even if they don't use it, They're, they do appreciate it. And the other thing I would say is promote other people as go-tos. In other words, maybe it is a football coach or a camogie coach or something like that at the moment. Ring those people yourself and say, listen, will you be available for them? And maybe even just drop them a text to see how they're doing. I've mentioned something here, which is a little bit controversial and please bear with me for a moment and humbly suggest that we'll deal with this in the next slide. If you don't have the relationship with your teenager, in other words, you don't have that closeness with them, then be careful not to challenge them quite so much. You might say, well, I'm more dad, I can challenge them if I want. Reality is they won't listen, but also the truth is that if you don't have the connection or the relationship, get somebody else, maybe it's mom or maybe it's dad, to be able to assist with that um, because they may listen to them. Um, and if you don't have the relationship, now's a good time to try and get create that. We've got time to do it, um, and how can we do that is what I'm gonna talk about next. This is something, uh, there's a book written by a guy called Gary Chapman, which is a wonderful book called The Five Love Languages. If you go to Google and simply put in the Five Love Languages test, there's one available up there for adolescents and also for couples. So if you haven't done this uh, as a couple at home, perhaps with your wife or husband or partner, then this is something that's very, very useful. Um, I think I was about 10 years into marriage and had a wonderful conversation with my wife about how we show each other that we love each other. And it was so interesting because she was brought up different than I was brought up. And I was brought up in an environment where you told people you love them and you certainly gave lots of hugs and there was physicality attached to it. My wife's uh, was, was uh, 
especially for her in some ways, was actually spending quality time with her parents. Um, her father used to get up very early in the morning working um, and she'd spend time with him and get up very early to be with him. And it was a special quality time. So when we got into about 10 years of marriage, we ended up having this wonderful conversation about um, how we weren't <laughs> getting it right for each other, which was interesting, but also about how we needed to get it right for each other. So we realized that the ways we were sometimes doing it wasn't connecting for the other person. And we did a couple of things. My wife's love language was quality time. So I asked her, well, how, how, now that I know that that's your, your love language, so telling you I love you all the time or hugging you all the time, it might not be um, exactly reaching that love need for you. What do I need to do? And literally we sat down and she gave me some ideas. I said, okay, look, I need that connection a little bit every day, but a significant amount uh, even once a week. So we decided to do something that we call simply couch time. We've been doing it for 15 years or so. Our kids have grown up in it, which has been wonderful. And it's just literally getting together every day after dinner and we eat together as a family. And then mom and dad jump into the sit down on the couch and the kids don't even interrupt us. They come and uh, say, um, drop us in a cup of tea or something like that, or sometimes even bake for it, which is wonderful, but they don't interrupt us. And it's about 20 minutes or so for mom and dad just to catch up and to see how's your heart, how are you doing, how's things for you. And it's a wonderful time that we look forward to simply every day and we've also brought in our date night once a week which i just love and it's difficult at the moment every thursday night we don't miss it for anything we're doing it years and it's just a time where mom and dad get together and uh, you can go out for a meal or you can go for a walk at the moment obviously it's difficult it's back garden stuff mostly <laughs> which is um, a little bit different um but wonderful and it's meeting those needs now why am i telling you about this that's as couples but as kids uh, with all of our kids, we've tried this a number of times and played with it and worked with it. And in many of the cases, I got it wrong with my kids, thinking I knew exactly what their language was. And it was really interesting. So it's really uh, simple to do. Just you can do it with you. It's not cringy. It's a fun little exercise. And you find out what their language is. And then we ask them, how can mum or dad, how can, and it's not the same for mum and dad. They might have that love language met different by mum and different by dad. Uh, my, one of my daughters loves to go out for a meal with dad and loves to do things like window shop with mum. So it's different. And frankly, I'd hate the window shopping, but it's not doing things that I like with them, it's things that they like me doing with them, if that makes sense. So find out what their language is and find ways to meet it. And the great thing is that's all we do then. We don't have to try and find lots of other ways to do it. We simply do it that way. And uh, it works really, really well. Why am I saying that? We, particularly with kids and going through difficult times and heading towards leaving cert and all the different things that we're trying to do, it's very difficult to put in boundaries, rules, regulations, you know, all the different things we have to do at home, simple things. Uh, when we don't have the relationship. How do we develop the relationship is finding the love language and doing that. So we're literally meeting the underlying needs and then we can put in the rules and the boundaries. What we tend to get wrong as parents quite often is to try and put in the rules and the boundaries because we think we deserve respect and it should be because we're mum or dad. And kids don't respond to that so well. But if we do meet the needs and we have the relationship, those rules and boundaries follow so much easier. So hopefully that might just help a little bit. Kids will regularly say that respect comes jointly that it's both mom and dad and the young person that it comes jointly so i think respect congruence and integrity are formed that way through relationship and um, this is a simple tool uh, i do some corporate wellness with one of my pals and this is a simple tool that we talk about when we talk about wellness and it's i don't know about you but i find out if you ask your kids you know how you're doing how are things they they always will say things to you like i'm fine you know, or what's happening today? How is the house grand? It doesn't tend to be that they give you too much more than that. So quite often, I find this method is quite useful if you sort of say, well, where are you on the line? It's almost like once they understand it, and tell them about this, once they understand it, well, I'm, I'm a two today, they can decide um, that it's very difficult maybe to go from a two to a 10, but 10 being I'm amazing, one or two being I'm low. Um, it's very difficult to go from two to a 10, but it's not so difficult to go from two to a three or even from three to a four and ask them to find out ways. Well, how can dad, how can I, how can I help you get up to a three or a four today? What can I do that might assist? And simply that might be to make them some breakfast or get them a cup of tea or just something, a little show of love that will help. And that immediately brings them a little bit up the line. Use this with yourselves. You know, where are you on the line? Now, some simple, simple little tips that help that I find are very useful for that is this, and that is simply a, a, a keeping yourself well jar. And I would tend to use that. So where are you on the line with your kids as a conversation? And then get some post-its, put them in a jar, write down on the jar, on the post-its, different things that you can either do with them or that they can do for themselves, write them on post-its and put them in the jar, maybe about 10 things. And on those 10 things are different, different for your, for different kids, but also different for you. It might be that one of your kids loves going for a walk or loves 15 minutes watching something of their favorite program or, um, you know, 
going out into the back garden and playing with the dogs or something like that. Write down each of your children, what they are, the 10 different things that immediately if they do those things, it lifts them from a two to a three or a five to a six and write them and put them in the jar. And it's just a reminder for them. They can keep it in their bedroom or they can keep it in the kitchen that if they're feeling a little bit low, they have a prompt that they can go to that will immediately lift their mood and assist them into feeling better. And I suggest this is something that's wonderful for all your family. And you can also get a little bit fun and creative about it and slip in little things that you might do for each other. And um, what I mentioned here is, is kind of role modeling good behaviors. What do I mean? So it's as more dads that we're trying to keep as much as we can a peaceful home because you're looking after you. I don't know about you, but if I'm looking after me, even um, if I'm working clinically, I'm in my office all the time at the moment working clinically, but I'm online and I'm not meeting people face to face. So even just my day is different and I find it a little bit more tiring working online. So I find if I even just go for a five minute walk, 10 minute walk around where I am, where there's no people and I can keep social distancing, um, that I'm able to then jump in my car and drive home feeling more peaceful and calm than I would be if I just went straight home, for instance. It's just like downloading your day. So being able to keep a peaceful home happens because you're looking after yourself before you um, are trying to assist or help anyone else in the family. I've mentioned there showing unity and fairness in parenting, you know, and again, it's just looking after myself. If I'm looking after myself, I'm not quite so touchy and, um, you know, a towel being left on the floor doesn't upset me as much as it would if I wasn't looking after myself. Simple chores, what do I mean? Even with leaving cert students, um, expectations on a chart. My kids are like many kids. If you surprise them with, you know, will you do the dishwasher? The, the, the reaction is, is it, um, you've asked them to do something horrific. Uh, so what we decided to do since the beginning of this pandemic was simply because there's literally five kids at home and two parents, was to say the house doesn't just run itself and mum and dad are still doing some work. So it needs um, a little bit of simplicity of chores. And we literally have given them, you know, one or two things. It's every day there's something to do, whether it's helping make some food or whether it's cleaning up after dinner or uh, emptying a dishwasher or a bin or something like that, that everyone has their one job per day. And it's just one job, but once they do that, it actually helps them. Also, simple chores lead to resilience because it assists them in times of difficulty to do something that actually, even though they'll moan their way through it, perhaps makes them feel better and makes them feel like they're participating within the family unit. They actually, at the end of it, are glad they've done it if they were to be really truthful with you about that. So I also put that on WhatsApp and uh, in this age of technology, I, uh, my wife did up this list beautifully and then WhatsApped it to all the kids, which is wonderful. And then they can't get rid of it. They have it. It's there. So there's no surprises. Meeting love languages we've mentioned, creating the jar that we've talked about. We find eating together as a family is just helpful. It just unites us, keeps us close. Um, eating, having healthy eating uh, routines is important and good nutrition. But also, I'm going to talk about sleep in just a moment and exercise if that's okay. Just before we walk on to that, um, I want to just mention wake up reminders, not wake up rouse. I don't know about your house, but it was very easy in the beginning of this to have wake up rouse as opposed to wake up reminders. Wake up rouse don't work. Our kids will... Um, be on the edge of almost a, what I call a red zone. A red zone is mayhem, craziness, screaming, shouting, it all goes mad. Um, our kids can be on the, the edge of a red zone because they're frustrated, they're upset, they're not seeing their friends, their school year has gone crazy, they've got their leaving are coming up and they're on the edge of that red zone. And because they aren't working out of, forgive me, but a fully developed brain until they're in their mid-twenties and their cortex isn't completely developed, so they don't have the same neurological pathways that we do, they're working out of the reptilian part of their brain, which is more uh, reactive and emotive and wonderfully theatrical and, and all those things that are great in our young people. Um, but because they're working out of that, they'll get to the edge of the red zone and they literally will try and invite you to come in there with them. They'll almost be saying to you, come on, I'm, you know, I want to row, come, come, come. And we are the parents, we've got to stand on the edge of that red zone and recognize it for what it is, which is may total mayhem if we go there. And we've got to walk away. I call it the, um, the step met stop method, which is a CBT, cognitive behavioral tool, um, to be able to use with them, which is to um, simply stop what you're doing, take a breath, look at the bigger picture in all of this, walk away from it um, and think, what is it that I want? The bigger picture is here is I want peace in the home. I want things to be okay. And then the P part is plan accordingly and talk with them to get to a point where you're able to have a conversation in a green zone, not in a red zone, green zone where they'll usually come back after you know getting upset and say, I'm sorry. And then you have a conversation about it. Now, look, there may be consequences, but there's, uh, there's never learning and nothing good happens in the red zone, but there is in the green zone. So try and get them there and assist them there um, is great role modeling and learning learning for them. I'm going to talk for a moment about sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene isn't about having a shower before you go to bed. Sleep hygiene is about the patterns of how you, you create sleep for yourself. And modeling that yourselves as parents and ourselves as parents is really important. And um, preparation for bed is every bit as important as sleep. So 
a little bit of an explanation about that. We have forced them online, don't forget, and just very quickly to understand that, what are we saying? We, we've discovered through science that excess levels of screen usage during the day produces excess levels of cortisol in your central nervous system. So um, cortisol is the stress hormone. So as the stress hormone goes up, we are forcing our kids, because they're online now doing school and online studying and online talking with friends, all of that is excess levels of, of time. Think about it. For probably eight hours of a day, they were in school mixing with people, which is wonderful, doing sports, which is wonderful, and then coming home and going online a bit and then talking and maybe on friend, on, to friends online. We have massively increased that amount of time online. And it's okay for the moment. That's fine. We understand why we have to do it. But we also need to know how to counteract it, and which is what I'm going to give us some tips for at the moment. Um, so when they're online that, that for that long periods of time, um, and they're not getting quite so many breaks, they need to understand that that's bringing up their cortisol levels and their serotonin levels, which is their moods, are dropping because they're spending so much time online. Now, coming towards bedtime at night, melatonin, which is the, the hormone, sleep hormone, which produces sleep cycles, melatonin should rise. Melatonin, we know through science, is, is broken or disturbed or slowed down, if we want to say it that way. We know that melatonin is disturbed as it rises by cortisol. It stops it rising and it can, science would say, delay it. Uh, the production of melatonin, which will bring us into a REM sleep, a rapid eye movement, deep sleep, when all our brain replenishment and cells are renewed each day, it can delay it for a number of hours. So our young people are not getting enough sleep. And the common thing I'm hearing from our young people at the moment is they're not sleeping well during this time. And I think a lot of that can be due to the excess levels of time that we're spending online. So it's not a problem, but we need to know what to do about it. And that's where we, this, this uh, pattern comes in. So what I would say is, and I'll put this on the video for the young people so they can understand it as well. They don't just feel that mum or dad are giving out to them. Um, what we have to try and get to is a time where for the last hour or so before they're starting to head towards bed, not only are they not on screens because then the cortisol levels are not rising, but actually they're doing something to bring down the cortisol levels and to bring up their serotonin because serotonin and melatonin tone and rise beautifully together, whereas cortisol will stop the production or interfere with it. So an hour or so before bed, that there's absolutely no screens of any description. Now by screens, I mean, I mean things like uh, iPads, um, iPhones, uh, Samsungs, whatever, backlit uh, screens. TV's not so bad because it's got megapixels, so, but it doesn't help bring down cortisol, okay? Just to be clear on that. So, um, and it doesn't raise serotonin. So what are the things that we can do? Put the phones out at nighttime. There's no reason for them to be in their rooms if at all possible. Um, the very best routines that we can try and create for our young people just as they're heading towards sleep hygiene, heading towards bed, is these four things. Number one, to go for a walk. If at all possible, keep them within social distancing parameters and two meters, two kilometers, et cetera. Trying to get our young people to go for a gentle walk, which is obviously being safe, um, brings down cortisol levels, bring down stress levels and increases serotonin, which is wonderful. So having a gentle walk is exceptional. If it's at all possible, you can go for a walk with mom or dad because you can then have a, the next one, which is great, walk and talk. Talking face-to-face -face with another human being brings down cortisol levels, um, regulates the central nervous system and brings up serotonin. So um, coming downstairs and having that kind of a conversation even with mom and dad helps. Um, not online, because online does the opposite, brings, it, brings up the cortisol levels. Two great things to do in bed, if you can, which are wonderful, is have some magazines or books beside the bed, because reading, reading a hard copy of a book brings down our cortisol levels and it, it assists our serotonin to rise. And you know that if, you, if you're sitting reading, lying reading a book in bed, um, quite often you only get past a few pages and you start to fall asleep. So reading is exceptionally good. Writing too. Any of you who are creatives know this. It's exceptionally good to be able to uh, to, to do art or, or drawing. It immediately brings down our cortisol levels and assists with our stress, but also brings up our serotonin and our feel-good patterns. So that's really, really useful. But also just things like journaling, you know, taking um, some ideas that you might want to do during the week or your thoughts or your feelings during your day. Journaling or doodling in your, beside, you know, with um, a pen and paper or something is wonderful for, again, stress levels. So remembering that we're just trying to assist good sleep hygiene. And then most importantly, if we do get to bed and find it hard to get to sleep, that we kind of muscle through, um, get up certainly and maybe go downstairs and get a hot milk or a glass of water or something and then go back to bed and try again. Do break the cycle, but go back to bed and try again. Don't take the bait and go towards the screen because immediately you're increasing your cortisol levels and it won't assist you. You might say, oh no, it does. It actually helps me to fall asleep. Your body may fall asleep, but you're doing what I said earlier on, which is you're bringing your melatonin levels into check, which means you won't go into a REM sleep and you'll wake up really tired.
So just to finish, I'm going to give you my contact details. If there's anything we can do to help in Zest Life, we're happy to do that. My email address is simply stuart at zestlife.ie, or we have a text number in with any questions or queries that parents might have to assist. Please don't feel like you're stuck or you're on your own with this. We're really delighted to help in any way that we might be able to. You can simply text to that number 0872530189, and we'll be absolutely delighted to be able to connect with you. I appreciate folks that it is a, a difficult time at the moment and that we are coming through this pandemic. Um, I want to wish you safety and wellness. Um, and I, wanna, I hope that by having conversations like these with our kids and at home, but also with each other as, as family, friends and parents, that we're able to assist um, to bring down the stress levels or what I fear, which is that mental health stress levels um, during this pandemic, but also afterwards. Stay safe, stay well, stay well and God bless you. And uh, hope to catch up with you again soon. God bless. Bye bye.